When someone is used to paying a certain price for something, and then they see a higher price, a common reaction is to object. Being out of network is a form of a higher price when compared to in-network. The key is how you position an out-of-network practice to patients. And my guest today has done this successfully numerous times and is going to give us her insights. I'm Carl White, Principal at Mark Advisory Group, which is a healthcare marketing agency, and I'm also the host of Practice Care. The mission for both is the same, and that's to help private practice owners stay private. Not only is that what they usually want, but care is better when the provider owns the practice because that's when they're going to have the most freedom to make the clinical decisions they think are best. It's just different when somebody else owns the practice. Sometimes, usually, occasionally, their agenda starts to creep in and nobody ever gets hurt, nothing like that, but there's more to think about. Sometimes compromises have to be made. Why don't we just kick all that out and help providers stay as practice owners as well? My guest today is Kristen Mallon. Kristen is the CEO and co-founder of Femgevity Health a science-based practice for menopause. She's also a board-certified nurse midwife, menopause and and feminine longevity expert, breast health expert, and a published author. She graduated from UC Berkeley and attended Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. After completing her master's degree at NYU, she began practicing as a board-certified nurse midwife in private practice in Brooklyn. As a natural Californian, Kristen loves surf, snow, and hanging with her family in Northern New Jersey. Kristen, thank you for coming on Practice Care. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, me too. I love topics like this because these are like these can be like sort of they're abstract, but they're big and they can be sort of paralyzing and people don't know where to where to get going. And there's definitely answers to it. But I want to start with you where I start with every guest. And that's, you know, I asked for a short bio to read. There's clearly more to your story. You've bounced around a natural California now in my sort of neck of the woods of sort of the New York, New Jersey area. They're not the same. So tell us more about you, how you ended up where you are, how you ended up doing what you're doing. Yeah, I wanted to go into medicine and then I looked into going becoming an OBGYN because I really wanted to work with patients that were well. I wasn't really like enthralled with the sick care kind of model that we had mm. in medicine back then. Mm-hmm. And so I was in um, UC Berkeley at the time and then I started volunteering at UCSF, which is kind of like one of the larger hospitals like in the Bay area. And I was working in the women's health division and working on the labor and delivery floor, just like volunteering and, you know, restocking and bringing people ice and stuff like that. And I met these two, um, OBGYN residents and I was like, Oh my gosh, I idolize you. I want to be you. I mean, it was basically like a 13 year old seeing Taylor Swift. I was just like, (laughs) and they were like, let me sit you down. And they were like, you don't want to go into medicine. And here's why you're a woman. You don't want to end up spending eight years in school and then residency, and then maybe not ending up exactly where you want to be. And like your career doesn't really get going until you're in your thirties. They were like, be a midwife. They were were like, were they men or women or were they? They were both women. Both women. Okay. Yeah. And they were both like, we should have been midwives because in um, San Francisco at the time, there were a lot of midwives and we were working with a lot of midwives and they were like lamenting that they didn't take that path. And so that's kind of how I took the path of midwifery as opposed to traditional medicine. And then it's afforded me like midwives are kind of like the hippies of medicine. They're kind of seen as like the weird Barbie, like the fringe of medicine. And so our schooling is a lot different. We learned a lot about business in midwifery school, which I don't think any of my medical counterparts did. No. I, I I didn't expect to hear you say that because the, yep. the the comment is you know five trillion years on how to treat patients and not a sentence on business. So that's actually really encouraging. Yeah. So and I think that I'm the only person in medicine that I've ever come across that that's happened to, and I think it's because a lot of midwives um, are solo practitioners or work in small groups and own their own companies. Mm-hmm. And I was no exception. I had my own company as well, and so a lot of that came from like the foundation that I had had at school. I went to NYU, like you said, yeah. and so NYU you actually provided business for medicine as an elective um, when I was in school. Okay. So that's kind of how I became a midwife and got into medicine. And then, um, you know, they also teach us a lot about malpractice, malpractice insurance, like a lot about the business side of medicine that even when I started working in Brooklyn, I started working with doctors, like 
every OBG, I mean, I worked with way more OBGYNs than midwives and every OBGYN I ever came in contact with didn't know even a fraction of what I learned in school. Mm -hmm. um, I also had the benefit of, and I think I told you this before, my father is a, an entrepreneur and yeah. my mother has a master's in business. She has an MBA. She also is a doctorate in business and she taught business. And so I was very um, fortunate to have a very strong family of entrepreneurs, yeah. people that had their own businesses. And I had a lot of help and a lot of coaching along the way that kind of got me to where I am and, and, and starting all those different businesses that I started and being out of network, being in the, um, cash pay mm -hmm. medical field. Yeah. Yeah. When you grow up with that, right. It just, you sort of, my word is you marinate, you marinate in that for years and it just seeps in. Right. So yeah, you just, you see, but that's, that's really cool. Um, so let's get into it. And we're talking about positioning, right? Positioning, uh, an out of network practice and, and the rest of that statement, even though it's not stated is compared to in network. So start with the definition of terms. When you say positioning, what do you mean? Let's just all be talking about the same way in this conversation. Yeah. So for me, positioning is presenting, angling, describing, fronting, how it appears, how it, how it is perceived mm -hmm. by a consumer or by a patient, you know, depending on the taxonomy that you use to kind of, you know, is it client? Is it patient? Is it right. consumer? Like that's right. kind of the way I would describe positioning. Right. And, and yeah, like the, the, the word that's, it's, it's not even implied. I don't know what the right word is, but it's, it's an unstated, but it's, it goes with it is competitive, you know, competitive positioning. There's, there's not much to position if you're the only game in town, but you, you, you're being compared, right? Everybody has choices. And here you come along with a, with an out of network, therefore higher priced, uh, you know, offer. So why would they choose you when they prospective patients or clients or whatever have choices? So, okay, so good. So, so that's what we mean. Um, how do you, describe what's different and better about you. So let's get into it. Like, how do you do this? <laughs> how do you do it? You know, not generally, but yeah. how, how does Kristen do it? Well, there's lots of different ways. And I think it depends on um, the market that you're in and and kind of like how, how you want to go about it. So even what you just said right off the bat, like that it's a more expensive approach, it doesn't have to be. So okay. not every plan and not every program is the same in terms of what an out of network coverage offers and what in network in network coverage offers. And so sometimes I think it's just even just as a clinician and I'm really empowered by your mission because I feel the same way. I think the more that I can educate my fellow medical personnel yeah. about owning their own practices, staying in, um, I think that everybody who's a good clinician should be out of network. I think that it should become a new fad in medicine where like in network is kind of just your run of the mill basic care, like kind of what we have in socialized medicine yeah. and out of network is more like your higher quality, um, physicians that have like taken that extra step to kind of really like build a solid practice and um, they're offering something niche and something very specific, mm -hmm. which is why they are allowed to kind of go out of network. So just even kind of as a physician understanding that it doesn't necessarily mean it's more expensive and then kind of positioning that to patients that way. So some, one of the things like, I'll give you an example. One of the yeah. things that we used to do is that a lot of times we wouldn't even mention that we were out of network. We would just advertise like a regular business. Like we were just a regular doctor's office. So I obviously did all OBGYN, mainly pregnancy, childbirth, women's health, okay. you know, a little bit of hormone balancing, menopause, things like that. Okay. So we didn't do a lot of gynecology. We didn't do a lot of like surgery, endometriosis, fibroids, ovarian cysts. That, that was okay. not really like our main thing. That was the, the niche that we were in. Right. And so we would just advertise as being like um, choices in childbirth or, you know, a tr traditional midwifery care or um, a team approach or holistic care or integrative approach. One of the mm -hmm. practices that um, I had was called integrative OBGYN or integrative obstetrics. Right. And then when patients would call in, that's when we would put them to our concierge medical team to kind of explain to them their own insurance benefits. So we weren't even positioning ourselves in the marketplace at all as an out of network practice. We were just positioning ourselves as just a regular OBGYN office. And, and, you know, in our area, so we're in Northern Jersey and it's different in different parts of the country. Sure. Like in California, there's a lot of competition. And then in Chicago, there's competition, but mm -hmm. in most parts of the country, it's hard to even find a practice 
in obstetrics that's not hospital owned. And then mm. most of those websites are really hospital owned websites. Mm -hmm. So they're difficult to navigate. They're very large. You know, you're looking at a practice that has like a hundred physicians. You can't really tell who your doctor is going to be. There's not really a number to call or text. Mm -hmm. And so would make these websites that were really beautiful, really simple, call, text, email, contact mm -hmm. form, lots of different ways for them to contact us and not mention a thing about being out of network. And then mention that more on the back end mm -hmm. once we got them to establish a relationship with us and have a conversation with us so that we could then explain, well, what does that mean? You're not necessarily going to be paying more. You might actually end up paying the same or depending on your coverage, you might actually end up getting much, much better care for the same price or only like $100 more or $50 more than you would have paid if you had gone in network. So, okay. So it, it's, is it that depending on the insurance, it, it may have been something of a difference or something, not much of a difference. It really kind of, so you weren't saying we're out of network categorically, although that's true. You were, you were saying, I guess in a sense, there's no point in broadcasting that right away because the difference may not, the price difference really may not be that material. And so why don't we just exactly. wait until we can sit them down and then let's just explain take a look it. at your coverage and explain it and just do the math and compare it and they can decide. Yeah. Like and that. So, yeah. And so what we would do is that, you know, we would call it an insurance verification because we needed them to like yeah. allow us to get look into their insurance information for them and mm -hmm. give us permission to do that. You know, they would sign a form that allowed us to call their insurance on their behalf, or we would need their, um, we would need their insurance ID and their date of birth and their name so that we mm -hmm. would be able to actually get the information about their insurance, or they would send us their insurance plan. So we would call it an insurance verification. Sure. And really what we were doing is we were checking their benefits against like, well, what is their co-insurance? What is their copay? What is their out of network coverage? And there's simple ways to do that. You know, so someone who has an HMO plan doesn't have any out of network coverage and someone who has an EPO probably doesn't, but might. And mm -hmm. someone who has an EPO almost definitely does have out of network coverage. So there's simple ways to do that. There's companies that do it really quickly for you. A lot of offshore companies that can get this information for you really quickly, pretty cheaply. So you mm -hmm. don't have to spend a lot of your own administrative right. time trying to figure it out. Right. So part of the positioning was we're private and everybody else is in the, you know, if you want to walk into the large impersonal hospital based practice, um, that's an option. We are different. We're private. We're more intimate. You know who we are. Everything about us is easier. That kind of thing. That's part of the position. That's to me. That's like competitive positioning. We're 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 small and intimate. The care is awesome. They're large and monolithic. And if you have to go back every week, you might see different people. That's all sorts of differences. Um, to get mildly helpful mostly unhelpful, the anal. What I really like about what you're doing is it's like more of a sales process. You were saying, if it's not an issue, let's not make it an issue. Absolutely. You know? But if we say we're at a network and we broadcast that for every 10 people who might choose us, we're going to get a lot fewer to even call because they're going to make an assumption that might not be true. Exactly. And also it's really easy in medicine in a lot of places and, and North Jersey and, and the New York city metro area is no different. Most people who are in network or are running what we called, we always called them volume practices because mm -hmm. that's how they had to make their money. They mm -hmm. don't have a lot of human touch points. Mm -hmm. So when you call, you're going to get an automated system. You're going to have to schedule through an app or online. There's not someone who's going to get back to you. Everything's done through a portal. And mm -hmm. so- just to have someone answer the phone when it rings one to three times. I mean, we always used to say like has to pick up by the seventh ring yeah. and usually never let it go that far. Yeah. But to have someone say, you know, hi, my name's Kristen. This is Maternal Resources. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. Just that will go so far in getting people like invested in the type of practice that you have. Cause they're going to be like, Oh, when I have an issue or I have a billing issue, or I have a question, I'm going to be able to call. And within three rings, a human is going to answer the phone, mm -hmm. you know, nine to five Monday through Friday, or sure. even nine to th five Monday through Thursday, you mm -hmm. know, a reasonable amount of time that a doctor's office would be open mm -hmm. and they'll be able to get their questions answered. And I yeah. think a lot of times, like we, we'd get, we, people would tell us, oh, we'll get pushback from admins because they'll be like, well, I don't have time. I don't have time to spend 10 minutes on the phone or five minutes on the phone answering those questions. But those are other uh, companies that you can outsource that information. You can yeah. outsource all of that too, so that you don't have to have the people who are actually running your practice yeah. 
handling those phone calls. Yeah. Everything can be compartmentalized. And so like anytime I ever got pushback on someone who wanted to kind of follow the trajectory of going out of network, I'm like, there's an app for that. There's an app for that. I'm like, there's a company for that that can mm -hmm. handle like whatever that component is. Of yeah. Are you talking about like medical virtual assistants, kind of, sort of? Medical virtual assistants or virtual assistants. There's um, offshore, there's American-based, there's Canada-based. Yeah. There's so many choices yeah. when it comes to like doing those extra pieces of work. Yeah. Um, that when we, someone's making a decision about possibly going from out of network, in network to out of network, yeah. that a lot of times the staff will push back on because they'll be like, well, I'm not going to be able to handle the higher maintenance or the higher needs of this type of practice. But we would always tell people, um, anytime I would ever tell someone who's interested in going out of network, yeah. you're going to get five times to one, probably. So if you're seeing five patients in an hour, you could really see one patient in an hour and mm -hmm. make the same amount of money. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of the benefit of it. Yeah. We had a guest last year uh, who who runs a medical virtual assistant company, and it really opened my eyes. And and she's like, yeah, you know, these the sort of the the lower dollar value, but got to get done tasks like insurance verification, sort of yep. lots of phone calls. I mean, people could be really well trained, and as long as you, yeah, you know, as long as you're you're using the tech to to free up the in person time that you're going to need, then it's good. It just feels like with some, I don't know, the more traditional practices or, or systems or what, um, it just feels like the efficiency, you know, seams are starting to fray. I don't know how to describe it, but things are much things are much more tech enabled but I don't get any more time with my doctor, you know? And so I'm like, mm, it doesn't really seem to be, but the way you're describing it, absolutely. So that was with the the practice that you're in. Same thing with Femgevity. Is this like another example of your sort of positioning against the grain and is this like private pay out of network, et cetera? Yeah. So Femgevity is a really, it's kind of a different reason why we're cash pay. That's a cash pay um, business is because for menopause and hormone balancing specifically, there mm -hmm. aren't any CPT codes or ICD-10 codes for reimbursement. Oh, really? So, yeah. For yeah. for something that just about everyone's going to go through. Yep. Half the population. Interesting. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So That's there's- a miss. <laughs> Yeah, it's a huge miss. And I think it's going to change. I think that we're going to see. And so I think that in the future, there's a possibility that I could turn that into an out of network. I mean, this is just strictly cash pay because there's yeah. no other option. It's right. almost like acupuncture or how chiropractics used to be. You know, now we have some chiropractic um, reimbursement codes, Yeah, but it's, it's, it's totally like I, um, you know, going to a gym kind of idea mm -hmm. versus I think one, once those ICD-10 codes roll out, roll out and those CPT codes roll out, then mm -hmm. I could turn it into an ad and network practice. And I could do the same thing. You know, I wouldn't, I would do the same thing. I would not, I would say, um, works with most insurances. That was like a sure. very thing that we would say, because a lot of people that have commercial insurance do have some out of network portion. A lot of times they're not even aware of it, the patients themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it was an opportunity for us as the medical practice to educate the patient. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get pushback, you know, the patient would be like, well, let me call my insurance company and let me verify. And, you know, insurance companies don't want you to go out of network. So they're always, the insurance companies are always going to push back, but insurance companies are kind of seen as like the big, bad boogeyman, I think in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so most patients, I would say 90, even 95% of patients were willing to trust what we were saying because we had someone answer the phone in three rings Yeah. that, okay, this is what your insurance covers. This is what you're going to have to pay. This is your max out-of-pocket cost. Mm -hmm. This is like the most it could possibly cost you in the worst case scenario. Yeah. Uh, they were much more trusting of us. And then once the reviews kind of filtered in and, and the practice itself had a reputation, then we were mm -hmm. able to say, okay, like, well, if we were doing some sort of like crazy billing purposes, like that would be on the reviews and, yeah. you know, that would be a trust pilot or people would start writing about that yeah. and you know that we're not doing like abusive billing practices here. Yeah. So what, you know, a common thing, we've sort of hit this, but I want to ask the question just to, to bring it to the surface. A common thing when you see, you know, a higher price for something is to object to it. So you must have gotten objections. Um, we all do. It's a fact of life. What kinds of objections would you get? How would you respond? What what advice do you have on, you know, on objections? Because they're part yeah, of life. But, yeah, absolutely. So I always really liked from a marketing perspective, there's someone called Jay Abrahams. I don't know if you know who he is. He I think was I know the name. Yeah, like probably, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, he was like one of the top 
paid, like the highest paid consultants, like charge okay. $10,000 an hour or something for his marketing ideas. And hmm. I read a lot of his books, like when I was building practices, like, you know, when I was in my twenties and, and probably early thirties and a lot, I mean, I read so many marketing books, but his really stuck with me because he was really big into going outside your silo. So like if we're in healthcare, so go into automotive, go into the restaurant business, go into yeah. hospitality and pull from what they're doing because you can start doing the same thing in your, in your area. Mm -hmm. So I, what I did with that kind of concept that he made is that I was like, okay, well, what we're doing and what our practice is doing is like, we're like the Ritz Carlton or the intercontinental of healthcare mm -hmm. and somebody's going to pay for that. And someone's going to get that. And if you want that level of service, if you want five-star or seven-star service, when it comes to any hospitality or any type of restaurant or Michelin star, you're going to be paying for that service. Yeah. And if you don't want that, then there's always Marriott or there's super eight, or there's some, you know, motel that you could go to. Yeah. And so the objections that we would come up against is we would just be like, well, this is a much more personalized, high touch point quality care where you're going to get direct access to your physician. You're going to get your questions answered. You're going to have avail there's availability. You're not going to have to wait. The waiting room isn't for waiting. You know, we would say things like that. And so if that appeals to you and there are a set, there is a segment of patients where that appeals to mm -hmm. then or the practice for you. And if not, then, okay, go ahead and go to a regular in network practice and wait two hours and not have any personalized touch points and the receptionist isn't going to know your name and that's yeah. okay too. And what I would say too, for people that kind of push back and like, well, I don't want to pay and I don't want this. And you know, this isn't worth it. I'm just going to go somewhere and network. We'd always be super nice, super helpful, try to see ourselves and position ourselves as an expert and as someone that they could come back to. And the mm -hmm. door was always open to them if they wanted to like, of course, totally understand, makes no sense. After you have your first appointment, let us know if you want to come back or you want to come in. We actually ran free consultations for a while, you know, when we were, um, when we were like starting to build up, you yeah. know, we don't do that anymore. But when we were like, we had much more availability, we'd be like, you know what, why don't you come in for a free consultation, see what it's like, see what the difference is. Yeah. Why don't you go to that appointment? also come to our appointment, you know, in, in obstetrics that there's so many appointments, so it was easy, but I could see how it would be like, if it was in, you know, in dermatology or in a different type of field in medicine, you could be like, you know, come see us for a second opinion, you know, see what our doctors have to say. So that's kind of how we would handle pushback. And a lot of times if someone was calling us, like someone was seeing our website and someone was calling us a lot of times they eventually came to us, like they would eventually come around. And so I think yeah. that also goes back to what you were saying about positioning is that like having the message on your website or on any marketing material you have tell the right story. Mm -hmm. So you're reading the right, you're, you're reaching the right, um, you know, core persona or the right person yeah. with your messaging. Yeah. And then you cut back on pushback a lot too. Yeah. I, I love the part about go check them out, go have an appointment with them and then compare because part of what you're saying is, you know, it's if anybody can say, we're very personalized. And so in the six and a half minutes that I get with my doctor, man, it's really personal, but that's not really what you mean. But unless you, you're not going to, they have to experience it for themselves. It's pretty bold to say, go try them out, come check us out. And then you can compare and see if you'll see the difference. And then you can also decide if you value that or not. Those are two different things. It's, it's, it's really, I, I like it. I, you know, the other thing about, well, I was going to pick up the phone by the third or fourth, you know, ring or whatever you said, that's really, I like that one too, because the comparison is our customer service is awesome. Well, great. How am I supposed to tell if that's really true or not? Who's who's not going to say that? Everybody's going to say it, but it's very tangible to say we're going to pick them up by the fourth, by the fourth ring within these hours of these couple of caveats. That's very different. You can test that and you can see if it's true. I, I love it. Um, but really, what you're doing is you're you're saying our, you know, our our brand, our 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 practice looks like this. These are the these are the uh, characteristics of it compared to that. Um, these are the these are the characteristics of that. You decide, and it sounds like what you were doing is you were just talking people through the differences so that they could make a, they would have the information they need to decide what they want. Is that right? Like, you know, yeah, that consultation I, was here's how we operate, here's how they operate. Your choice. What do you want to do? But that's everything, you know. 
Yep. And I think that a lot of what we, you know, a lot of what we did internally with our team is one, we like built, you know, in, in all the businesses that I kind of worked in, we built like a very strong culture, you know, making mm -hmm. sure that everyone felt supported, that everyone was in the right seat, that everybody had what they needed to, and they felt like they were aware of what they were responsible for, that there was an accountability metrics. And then there's also the, the way that we kind of like position that that kind of then transfers over to how we treat the customer. And so mm -hmm. there was a lot of sales um, education too, which I think is also really not traditionally viewed or looked at when it comes to medicine or when it comes to a medical practice. Like there's so much altruism in medicine. And I, I say this all the time that doctors or physicians don't owe, and any, any practice owner doesn't always see what they're doing as making money as a good thing. Like, mm -hmm. I think there's a subconscious underlying kind of sensation that like, well, I need to be helping people. And I went into this for an altruistic reason to like be a good person and to do good that yeah. I can't make money too. But those can both, it doesn't have to be this or that. It can be this and that. Yeah. And so because it is a business, it is it is a sales, it is a sales cycle and it is a sales process. And so mm -hmm. training anybody who answers the phone. I mean, we did a lot of sales. We did a lot of Ted talks and a lot of sales books and a lot of sales, um, training in groups so that people would understand things like when someone calls, try to say their name three times, make sure you introduce yourself, like try to have a personalized approach to when yeah. you're answering the, the phone and things like that. So I think that's kind of like a different way to look at medicine too, is that it's a business and that's okay. And actually that's a good thing. Yeah. And you know, this is where all the connotations of sales just, just hurt it. Cause you're right. It's a sales process. Um, it's an edge, call it an education process. If you want, I always thought of it as, you know, a patient is hoping to choose when they choose a provider, they're hoping to stay with them forever, right. For as long as needed or forever. And so there's a, just, there's more of a trust factor that's got to be there compared to buying lots of other services or products. And then what they really want to know is what's it like to work with you? You know, what would it look like if I came here? Um, and if you edge, just like what you were doing, this is what it looks like to be a patient with us, everything we could possibly think of to tell you. And then you make a call. And usually if you can whack away more question marks than the competitor, you're going to win because they have a better understanding of what it would be like to, to, to become a patient of yours. That's a sales process. I mean, there's other things too, you know, don't, don't be inauthentic, but you should know somebody's name, whether you're trying to convince them or not. Um, I love it. It's just, and you're right. It's the part of, I had a guest last year uh, who who said in med school, they never came out and said earning money by treating patients was dirty and ugly and horrible, but the message was loud and clear. That's totally. what they think. And, you know, well, damn. <laughs> so a good proportion, we're going to go out and open a business, a practice, and you're not teaching them anything. So on top of that, it's dirty to do so. So yeah, I, yeah. I love what you, what you, what you describe. Yeah. And I think that when, when I was kind of doing this too, and like back to Jay Abrahams, because I think I learned so much from him. Like one of the things that I always looked to is I was like, there are doctors that are doing this. So like what fields was it okay to make money? And it was really like, it's okay to make money in dentist dentistry. So a mm. lot of dental practice are really good at advertising. And so I would look to see like what they were doing, um, orthodontist or any cosmetic dentist, dentist, mm -hmm. plastic surgeon. So it was okay mm. to make money in plastic surgery. A lot of them had really good sales tactics. They had mm -hmm. really good marketing. They had really good websites. They had really good personnel. I would walk into a plastic surgeon's office, see what they were doing differently. And the same thing with dermatologists. Mm -hmm. So dermatologists, it was like also okay to make money in dermatology. So those were the areas where I tried to bring that to obstetrics and to pregnancy and to childbirth and women's health mm -hmm. to be like, okay, what are they doing? And it's okay. Like a dentist is still trying to help people. Yeah. But they're all make money too. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's, it's, uh, it's like a classic kind of marketing, you know, challenge here. You want to be different in some way. You got to be better in some way if you're going to be different, valuable. If you're if you're different, but you know, in a way that nobody cares about, you got nothing. And if you're valuable, but you're the same as everybody else, you're you know, kind of who cares. So you really have to be both. Um, a couple of wrap up questions I ask every guest. I I say this to a lot of guests. We can go on for a long time, but bite sized advice here at Practice Care. First one is, is there anything you think I should have asked you, but I just didn't ask you? Um, I think like, like where could someone start? Like if they're trying to, if they're thinking about like, okay, I have a practice, I'm in network, I'm struggling, like what should I do? Yeah. And I, there's, I would say two things. One is that there's always going to, there's coaches out there that do this. There's coaches mm -hmm. that take 
people from in network to out of network. And I've seen this happen, like with some of my colleagues where they do it and to have someone hold your hand and walk you through it is really easily easy. Yeah. But if you're not sure about working with a coach or you're not sure if you want to do it, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be all or nothing either. Sometimes people can start with just one uh, low paying or one insurance company that they don't have a lot of patients in, you know, like 2%, 3% of patients or one insurance company where it's really, really low reimbursement. Yeah. And then just network with one insurance mm. and then kind of put their foot in the water and see how it goes. Um, most of the time when people do that, it goes really, really well. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I haven't been doing this all these years and that I've been in network, like having to see 30 people an hour when I could have been seeing 10 people an hour and making yeah. more money. Yeah. People. Yeah. And, and I'll add, I mean, it's funny, you, you, you got to the next question too, which is this. So the next wrap up question is if somebody's excited about this or they've been, you know, they want to get going or they're stuck, uh, any tips that they could use to get started, get off the starting line. Um, I'll say, you know, another one is if you're going to do this, um, if all you're going to do is take the practice that's, let's say, traditional fully in network today and say, I'm going to take the whole thing and be out of network tomorrow and you don't change anything else. You just took the same service levels and made it more expensive. At least that's the perception of it. Um, so there's got to be something that you change to say for this perception of extra money, even if you know the insurance side by side that you do doesn't always come out to be true. There's got to be some reason for somebody to consider me. There's got to be something different compared. So do a very good, it doesn't take long. Who are your competitors within whatever radius is your reasonable kind of capture area and see what they do, see what they offer. Because if you're going to, if they're going to stay in network and you're going out, there's got to be something different and better about you for doing that. Um, a lot of the things that you said about, you know, faster response time, more personal, whatever that target customer, the target patient values, you got to have something you do. Otherwise, you know, if think about something you buy at the grocery store every week. If they, if they jack their price up by 25% and didn't change anything else, would you still pay for it? That's what everybody's thinking, or they're going to think if you do this without making it more valuable in some other way. So yes, I'll, I'll stop now, <laughs> but it's just, it's got to be better in some way. Um, any other tips that you'd offer somebody who's thinking like, I'm stuck at the starting line. I'm enthusiastic. I'm just, I don't know where to start. Yeah. I think <clears throat> another thing too, that I see with doctors is like, Anybody who's like so busy, like they're just like, I'm so busy. I'm so bogged down with patients. I have so many patients. That is the perfect practice to do yeah. this because that means that there's so much demand that they're going to be able to, if they just take a little bit of that burden off of the mm -hmm. patient load, they're going to be able to like handle all of the I think kind of support that needs to go along with being an out of network practice, which means like no wait times, mm -hmm. making sure everybody's greeted appropriately, like, and has really good customer service and like customer yeah. support, care support, that yeah. that's the best practice to do it is someone who's like super, super, super busy and super bogged down and super overloaded. Yeah. So if you have like, you know, I'll make it up 2000 patients, chances are, um, 15, 20, right. 15, 20% okay. yeah. would say, I'll come along. I'll yes. stick with you because they're, yeah. you must be pretty good at it if you have that many. Right. So, so take some heart in it. I'll add one other is, you know, find some of those, some of your, your peers and colleagues around you who are doing it or have done it, grill them how to go, what'd you do? What would you change if you could do it over again? Uh, what's next? Any tips? And, and they'll, it's one nice thing about doctors. They're very sharing with each other and there's really, um, you'll find some people who help you. So, so yeah. So any other, before we wrap up, any other tips come to mind? Those are the the big ones. And that it's not, I think that most of the times whenever I talk to doctors, they're like, they think it's so daunting and so overloading. And like, I just can't encourage doctors enough to consider it because it's such a better lifestyle and yeah. it's so worth it. Yeah. It's so worth it to do it. And, um, and I really think that this is where the future of private medicine, like that's just where insurance companies are pushing us. They're pushing, they're squeezing us out. They're taking, they're cutting reimbursement. Like it's either you go into a big MSO, like a big managed care organization, and you lose yeah. a lot of control of your private practice, which is a, where I see a lot of like my friends and colleagues going, or you really believe in yourself and believe that you're like a fantastic doctor, which you are, and that people will still continue to come to you, even in this type of environment. And like, I just so want to encourage anyone to do it because I really, really believe that it's what's best for both physicians and patients. I think it's a win-win for both yeah. sides. Yeah. 
And, and I'll, I'll, I'll put a bow on that. So if, if Kristen just didn't convince you that this is doable, if you're saying to yourself, I could never, or I can't, well, you could, because you're not the first, you're far from the first. And so, you know, it's been done over, it's probably happening right now, right? As we speak, somebody's Absolutely. doing this. And it have to be perfect. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Start. To, exactly. Do You'll learn. Just go out of network with just one insurance yep. and let the pieces fall from there because that's usually what I've seen my colleagues that do it. That's what happens is they're yeah. like, oh my gosh, like they get that first out of network check and they're like, why didn't I do what this? The what took me? That's so much bigger. <laughs> exactly. You call, is this right? It seems yeah. too big. <laughs> no, no, it's right. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then even within that, there's a lot of um, leverage. And you and I talked about this a little bit before, and this is totally a separate topic that mm -hmm. I won't go into too much, but there's a lot of leverage that comes with not being in contract with insurances. Mm -hmm. So a lot of leverage in terms of getting paid a lot more. And so yeah. that there's even just the 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 bottom, the bottom base of add a network is so much better. Think about like once you really get into it and you really get into arbitration and you really get into negotiating, like yeah. how money yeah. there is made yeah. there. I'll add a little story to that, then then wrap up. A client of mine who was also a guest, she tells this story of I think she was she was still with insurance and I forget the circumstances, but she sees a patient with a gash in the patient's leg and she sews it up. She's a primary care doctor. She's now in some long battle because she's not a surgeon and she shouldn't have been doing it. She's, should I have let the guy like seriously? Mm -hmm. So you get to wash all that stuff, sort of stuff away. And it's such a, I hope an extreme story, but oh my God, to make your point. Well, Kristen, as we've said now a couple of times, we could go a long time on this, but I uh, want to wrap it up and just say, thank you so much for coming on Practice Care, for shedding some light on this, on this topic. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for um, letting me talk about it. I'm really passionate about encouraging doctors to to do this too. Yeah, absolutely. And a couple of points before we wrap up. First, um, we're going to get all the contact information that Kristen provided into the show notes for the episode. Anybody who wants to learn more about her or what you do, contact you. That's that's one way they can do it. Um, if you are if you are a private practice owner and you've got experience on the business side of private practice like Kristen, or if you're someone like us, you serve private practice owners, some experience you'd like to share. Either way, we want you to come on Practice Care and tell the world about it. In the show notes for Kristen's episode and every episode, there's a link, a couple of quicks. It's quick. Tell us what's on your mind so we can get you scheduled as soon as possible. And finally, we do a new Practice Care episode every week. And the easiest and best way to stay up to date is to subscribe. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google, YouTube, pretty much every major platform, every major, every major player. Subscribe so that when new episodes drop, you can get them right away. Thanks very much. And until next time.